food is essential for us to live, but to live the good life, we need nutritious food. So the same goes for our birds. And today we're going to go through a variety of topics. First, we're gonna talk about what, then we're gonna talk about how, and then we're going to talk about why. So this is kind of the general outline of how we're going to approach our discussion today. And I'm sure we'll have plenty of time for questions later as well. So please jot down your thoughts, ideas, input, uh, or anything else you'd like to discuss and we'll ha hopefully have plenty of time to address any issue you might think of along the way. Um, let's start with what. So computer, move forward. All right, there we go. All right, variety. There's just a wealth of possible food options in the world, not only for us, but for our birds. And I believe the most important thing we can do for our birds is to offer them a great variety. Not only is it um, healthy for their body, but it's entertaining and satisfying and nurturing for their minds. So, you know, they're super smart creatures and to just sit around all day with not much to do or new things to try or opportunities in their environment, that's a pretty dull life. So nothing makes me happier than to see birds like this with things all over their beaks, um, enjoying all the good opportunities that we provide for them. So let's start with some of the food groups. Um, one of my most favorite and highly recommended options for food for your birds is a fruit veggie salad. That's raw fruits and vegetables that give them the opportunity to get the nutrients they need, which vary by each aspect of every kind of fruit and vegetable. And, you know, we're all leading busy lives. So sometimes it's helpful to make a few things ahead of time, which is just fine. But I do recommend that um, you do it for only a minimum of, I mean, a maximum of two to four days because some fruits and veggies will break down or saturate into each other, especially cantaloupe. Um, my other recommendation is to make sure that it's not too wet. So, you know, something's sitting in moisture for a long time, it can start to break down. You'll find that your bird probably appreciates or enjoys some fruits and veggies more than others, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep trying to offer variety. Because, you know, one day they may not like the kiwi and the next day it's the only thing they want to eat. So never give up trying to provide different options. The other thing I recommend is that if you do make it ahead of time, make it for just a day's worth. That way you're only opening what's needed for that day and you're not exposing it to air. Air is what causes things to break down faster. So, you know, if you have one bird, you're gonna have a very small container. If you have a group of birds, you might wanna do um, something like the one with the blue lid here. For us in the adoption center, that one with the blue lid basically is part of their diet and it feeds all the birds in the adoption center out of that one container. So, you know, adjust to what fits for your household. Most, a lot of fruits and veggies do not freeze well. So not only um, is it better to just make a little bit, but um, it keeps it more fresh. And I can't say enough about hot peppers. They are one of the best foods for your bird for vitamin A, which we'll talk about in more detail down the road here. So um, color, the more color you have in your bird's diet, red, green, orange, blue, et cetera, um, then you know they are getting the variety that they need. Some food can be chopped up easier than others. I find that carrots and broccoli do really well, even pulse really well in the, uh, like a Cuisinart, but other foods don't, they become mushy or wet. So let's say you really want your birds to eat some carrots um, and they're not picking up carrots individually. You could pulse a little bit of carrots and stir it into the rest of the fruit salad. And that way they're getting a little bite without even knowing that they had that carrot or that broccoli. 
The other thing I want to recommend is that you avoid warm food because warm food is uh, more along the lines of what birds in the wild do for their mates or their or their chicks. And that is not the relationship you have with your bird. You do not want to uh, spark any kind of mate behavior. Also, we see in almost every relinquishing form that comes to us how the birds love the pizza and the pasta and all those carb things that we all also enjoy, but those are really not healthy for your birds and they will fill them up. And so it's more about what your bird eats, not what you provide. So if you're providing something that they fill up on, they're gonna have no room for the things that they really need to eat. Oops, sorry. All right, let's talk about grains. There are all kinds of grains that are um, definitely enjoyable by many birds, especially I think the smaller birds, cockatoos and grays, they all seem to be more grain oriented. But what you want to avoid is that non-nutritious white rice. So um, we are big fans of quinoa, which is a uh, perfect protein and easy to cook. We're also big fans of kamut, which has, um, it's like a, a larger than brown, a brown rice type size. And we undercook it so it's still kind of crunchy and the birds really enjoy that. I've separated it out here between um, wheat and non-wheat. And that's just anecdotal uh, thinking that in some cases, some birds may have a reaction to wheat just like humans do. So if you had a feather plucker or even a collectus sometimes can be very sensitive, you might wanna stick with the non-wheat options, but um, they're all great. And uh, the other thing about grains is that they can be fed dry, soaked, sprouted, or cooked. So they have lots of versatility. And the little birds like parakeets, lovebirds, cockatiels, they, they can benefit just from simply soaking those grains overnight. That just, it makes the enzymes come to life. It's, uh, you, if you wanna sprout it a little bit more, which we'll talk about in a minute, that's even better, but they're very versatile. Um, so here is an example of the mash that we make at the landing. And so the kamut is, I don't know if my cursor will work uh, for you all to see, but it's the one that looks like oversized rice. And parakeets to macaws really seem to enjoy it. They use their hook bill to scoop out the inside of the kamut. And so it keeps them very busy as well as nourished. And then this particular recipe freezes very well. Um, I know there's some recipes that uh, call for a ton of things in it before it's frozen, but I have just found that some of those things um, tend to get too much moisture or break down or just are not appealing to birds. These are kind of the tried and true ingredients, and I have a recipe for you that we have found uh, freeze well and seem to be appealing to all kinds of uh, species. So the next um, uh, area of food options are legumes, which are like pods. And um, these are a little bit different. You cannot feed them raw. You must either uh, sprout or cook them. Um, the ones that are like beans, that is. And so be very careful, you know, not to do a bean like a black bean or pinto bean and try to sprout that because it would be somewhat toxic. But the ones listed here, mung, azuki, lentil, garbanzo, and green, green peas are all very sproutable. And um, I, I like them all actually. Mung happens very fast, especially in the summer um, and seems to be enjoyable by most species. Garbanzos are a little bigger, so the smaller birds are not too uh, keen on them. But um, sprouting in any capacity is one of the most healthy food groups you can give to your birds because it's a live plant. So there are all kinds of sprout kits, which you can certainly try. I also like the mason jars with the sprout toppers. And you see the company here where you can find those toppers. Um, 
because you could see what's going on inside the jar and it gives you an opportunity to know when you've sprouted enough or when it needs to be rinsed again, et cetera. So I know it can sound intimidating to, to people who've not ever sprouted before, but please don't be intimidated once you do it. It's very easy. And if you wanna just start with soaking some grains and not actually sprouting them, that's a really great way to get started. If you want to buy them in the store, be very careful. Um, sprouts can go bad. Always use your nose to see if they're like um, developing any mold or whatever. And if I do buy them from the store, I always reach to the very back and get the one with the latest possible date. And the only one that I've really found that I'm comfortable with upon occasion is the one I show here, the organic crunchy mix. Um, and, the, and then the other thing about legumes are uh, veggies that are like pods. For those of you of Amazons, they seem to really love snap peas and English peas. Um, we've watched them in the wild eating a lot of pods. It's just one of their natural inclinations, I think. But um, it, they're just uh, snap peas and other things that come in pods are a lot of fun too, because then the bird has something to basically forage, hold in its feet manipulate, etc. So, you know, if you think about what a bird does in the wild, they have to look for the food, they have to pick the food, they have to manipulate the food, and then they eat the food. They don't just put it in their mouth. So in captivity, we have to think about offering more of those kinds of options where they're, they're actually doing something with their food to occupy their time and mind and keep them busy in a positive way. These are two little parakeets that are at the landing right now. The yellow one is Mario. And, you know, for the most part, he, I, could, I wouldn't say that he ate a lot of the fresh food we offered him. Maybe he dabbled. But once little Chip came along here and showed him how much fun it was to just dive in, especially the sprouts and little bits of broccolini, et cetera, they just go at it all day long. So um, that's one benefit of having more than one bird is they often teach each other the good things, sometimes the not good things, but definitely they can teach each other the good things. Protein, we all need protein to survive, right? Um, protein can be somewhat controversial depending on who you talk to in the veterinary community. Um, quinoa is the grain that's a perfect protein as is any kind of bean rice combination. Um, I am personally kind of a fan of a little bit of egg uh, but I know that that can be um, controversial with some veterinarians. Um, uh, if your bird is really sick or vitamin A deficient, I mean, egg yolk is a great way to get them um, back on track faster. Uh, other kinds of protein that are dairy oriented or meat oriented, I would be more judicious about and uh, definitely limited. Um, on the bottom right, you see uh, little wedges of eggs um, from macaws. I usually feed two of those little wedges a day. If it was a medium-sized bird, maybe one wedge a day. If it was a smaller bird, maybe even less than that. So we're not talking about a high volume and definitely you know, good to be uh, fed in moderation. The other thing about eggs, besides being so wonderful for vitamin A and D3, is that you can put other things in them. So if your bird has trouble eating certain things that they need to eat, or you know, even a conduit for medicine, eggs are very um, desirable by most, most birds. It's often the first thing they go to eat. So it can be a conduit for other things, which is you know, a useful tip. So here's that uh, abbreviated version of our mash that I promised you. And um, if it's too complicated or too hard to do, you're not gonna do it, right? So I recommend that you start simple and easy, something you can manage without too much trouble. So I used to cook things in, you know, all separate in different pots. Now I just start with one pot. I put the thing that takes the longest to cook in there. You know, a few minutes later, counting down, I put the next thing in there, et cetera. So it's all in the same pot. I've even gotten to where I buy some of these uh, pre-shredded uh, 
butternut squash or sweet potatoes and just chop them up a little bit more. If you have a smaller bird, if you have a big bird, you don't have to chop them up at all. Just throw them in at the last minute to get a little steam because cooking will not take away the vitamin A from those kinds of vegetables. In fact, sometimes it brings it out a little bit more. So again, if you're gonna add other fresh veggies, I only recommend broccoli and carrots for pulsing so they don't break down and make more moisture. And then at the very last minute, throw in some mixed frozen vegetables if you want, because you're immediately going to put it in containers and put it back in the freezer. So you don't want to leave those frozen veggies out very long where they're going to thaw, cause more moisture, because the goal is to have minimal moisture. Okay, so let's talk about supplements. Um, all birds absolutely need essential fatty acids, as do we. It's super important and it's uh, really important for birds who are vitamin A deficient. They need that, that's a fat soluble vitamin. So they need that uh, omega-3 or essential fatty acid in order to absorb that vitamin. That's really important. So um, I'm gonna show you some samples in a minute about the things that have more omega-3s. But omega-6s are another important one, but the problem is these days in both the way we farm as well as processed food, they're super high in omega-6s and it's the omega-3s that we really need more of. You're gonna get the omega-6s so easily from things, but it's a little harder to get the omega-3s. So sometimes you have to make a concerted effort to do that. Um, we, Dr. Scott Eccles, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, created this, um, uh, flax omega-3 oil called Vet Omega, which is plant-based, um, and you can now buy it directly. Not all, I don't think you have to go through a veterinarian anymore. So that's vetomega.com. Um, it's uh, one of the higher end when it comes to flax oil type oil. Uh, it's expensive, but I think it's worth it, especially if your bird has heart disease or other things. Some of my other favorites, especially if your bird has an immune system problem is uh, DMG. And you can actually get that online now through Amazon. And um, in the far right corner, this uh, raw uh, food salad topper is one of my favorites. I love it myself, but it's just full of all the things that have high um, omega-3s in them like chia and unhold sesame and pumpkin seeds, et cetera. So if you are trying to get your bird to eat something new, sometimes something like that is a great little topping to get them, you know, diving into the rest of the food. I also love uh, milk thistle seeds. A lot of birds have liver issues. So milk thistle is really great for that. And, you know, you can, they, they really can't eat too many milk thistle seeds. It takes a lot of milk thistle seeds to be supercharged. I'm sure some of you have had your veterinarians uh, prescribe milk, th milk thistle lactulose when your birds had a liver reading that was not, you know, in line. Um, this is not going to solve that problem if you're if the liver values are way out of whack, but it is certainly not going to hurt and can be helpful in presenting for pre preventing certain problems. Um, and then um, there are lots of real flowers, herbs, spices. We'll talk about a few of them in a minute, but um, you know, this little Quaker here, the kale ca uh, started growing in the aviary and it got to a point where it bloomed and they loved to eat the little flowers and pods at the end. And then after that, we pulled it out, but you know, it's a nice opportunity to eat some real flowers. And we had a yes. great question come in um, that seemed good to talk about while you're uh, talking about the supplements, the, the DMG and the Vet Omega, just in how, how do we feed it to our birds? Okay, great. Um, in fact, I think in a couple of slides, I'm gonna actually give you the Vet Omega dosage. Um, and that's great for those of you who want to follow you know, that prescribed amount. I must confess, I'm one of those cooks who doesn't measure very well. So I tend to take a little Vet Omega and I swirl it around in the mash and stir it up. And that is basically how I measure that. 
um, if I had a sick bird, I might want to make sure they were getting more of something. Uh, as far as DMG, again, it's one of those non-invasive things. It's not really going to cause a problem. Um, they have now added birds to the back of the bottle with prescribed amounts. Um, but it's a very uh, pleasant tincture. And usually you can just put a drop or two on their favorite foods and that's sufficient. And if you had a bird that you thought um, had a propensity to illness or might be fighting something, uh, I think DMG is fabulous. I personally take DMG. I just think, especially if I'm getting on an airplane or going into a high risk situation, um, it's just a superb immune booster. And there are several veterinarians now who've become fans of it as well. I'm really glad to see that um, blending into the avian community. I think it's been in the horse, dog, cat community for a long time, but it's now uh, migrating into the avian community as well. But you won't find that many veterinarians who really know about it, uh, but they're getting there. Okay, so here is some comparison to omega-3 and omega-6, because I just want you to see that you go to the store and you buy one of those bags of macaw food that's full of peanuts and colored pellets and a whole bunch of less than optimal nutritious stuff. It's going to be 5,500 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3. That is just way out of whack. Inflammation is largely caused by too much omega-6 and not enough omega-3. So our goal for ourselves and our animals is to have more omega-3. So um, um, as you see, walnuts are four to one. So that's a much better ratio. Okay, here's more about the vet omega and the back of the bottle I wanted you to see what it says, it says 0.22 to 0.44 per kilogram of body weight. A kilogram is a thousand grams, which is roughly the size of most blue and gold macaws. You know, grays and Amazons are more three to 500. So you're not talking about the need for a whole lot, but it's also, it's not, if, you, if they get more than that, that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. So don't worry about overdosing be more concerned about not enough omega-3 in the diet. That's really important. Now, things like coconut oil have no omega-3s in them, but they have other great properties. Uh, and I know um, Jason Crean, who many of you know, is especially a big fan of coconut oil. And I wouldn't say that it prevents fungal infections, but it certainly helps contribute because it's got caprylic acid. Um, caprylic acid sounds scary, but it's really not. If you ever have a yeast infection, which is fungal, caprylic acid is terrific. And um, I am not a veterinarian. I'm not prescribing anything here, but I could just tell you that I have used caprylic acid successfully when birds have had uh, any kind of yeast. It's a, a really good uh, fighter of yeast infections. Um, or anything fungal. So the other thing about flax is I hear people saying they put flax in their bird bread that, that they cook and stuff like that. And I, I just don't know if the flax holds up omega threes when it goes through fire. It's not, it's, or heat. It is not one you use to cook with. You can definitely use canola or olive oil or palm oil or other things for cooking. Uh, I use coconut oil, frankly, for cooking eggs. I think that's a great way to put some coconut oil in the diet. Some birds will even hand them coconut oil on a spoon and they'll lap it up. I mean, they seem to know when they need something like that. Uh, Buriti oil is a fairly new thing in the bird world. It turns out that it's one of the primary nuts that's eaten by some South American birds. You could actually, um, buy it now uh, as a supplement. Um, and it's because it's unusual, it's omega-9, which is not something we talk about very often, but you know, just um, information out there for you to further look into if you think that might be something useful for your bird. All right, in case you're wondering, how do I get more omega-3s without that flax oil? Well, here's, you know, some 
other um, easily provided foods for our birds. Um, walnuts are definitely great. Of course, if you have an overweight bird, especially those Amazons, which tend to be heavy bodied perch potatoes, you know, don't get too carried away on the, on the higher fat end, but uh, walnuts are very, very healthy in many ways. So uh, not shown here are also unholed sesame seeds. That's when they're still brown or pepitas, the little pumpkin seeds that are green. Those are great. Quakers especially love the pepitas. So herbs and spices, um, they keep life interesting and, you know, birds, don't have the same taste buds that we have. I think we have nine to 10,000 and they have more like, I don't know, three to 400, something like that. So that's why they can eat jalapeno peppers or cayenne peppers or any of those supercharged vitamin A hot things and not flinch because they don't taste them the same way we do. But um, they still enjoy herbs and spices. So in some cases that can make or break their interest in a particular food. So why not try it, right? Um, it is recommended these days that we um, use the Celan, Celan, however you say it, cinnamon, because the other one has been shown to, um, I think it's Coumarin that causes the blood thinner of some birds. I do not have any firsthand knowledge about that, but that seems to be uh, an important thing to consider these days. Um, this site, mdvaden.com, a, is a great, great place for learning about what um, trees, flowers, plants, et cetera, are safe for birds. He, he really goes the extra mile to talk through um, problems. And it's, it's the one site that I really recommend over all others. And then I love this little chart. I hope she's still making them. We don't have them in our store anymore, but um, um, this herbs to the rescue, she does one on, um, I think she does one on anatomy and another one on first aid. They're just nice um, laminated uh, quick references. So if you guys have questions about any of these herbs and spices, we can certainly talk through some of those as well. All right, pellets. You know, when you go to your veterinarian, they're going to tell you feed pellets 50 to 80% of the time. And you know, for some birds, that's really what needs to happen because they're not eating anything else healthy. But if your bird's eating a lot of other healthy foods, then maybe that ratio can change. Um, in some cases, pellets becomes a more minimal part of the environment. And for a collectus, it's probably pretty important for some not to have pellets at all. And you really need to read the ingredients because pellets are often full of corn, soy, et cetera, which for some birds can be a problem. Um, just know that there's a difference. Some are cooked with high heat, which means they're gonna last longer and they're able to stay outside of their uh, the refrigerator or protection uh, longer without molding. But some are compressed with lower heat, which can make them healthier, but it also means they break down faster, especially if they're organic. And I love the new Lefevre's tropical fruit pellet. Um, I haven't tried it with all the birds in the adoption center yet, but my birds have all taken to it very well. Um, the only other thing I'd say is please avoid those colored pellets. It keeps you from understanding your bird's poop and when there's a problem and the dye doesn't do anything to, for them nutritionally. So it's all beautiful and all that, but it's really, it, it just has no value. So why do that? So, uh, and then Pam Clark, she was an early mentor to many of us. She was just always way ahead of the power curve when it came to understanding nutrition and she continues to evolve in her thinking in a really really great way and we recommend her blog for many purposes but she's also got um, some good information on her blog post which is I got a link here as well all right so we're also big fans of Nutriberries I know Dr. Lefevre personally um, and 
have had the opportunity to talk to him about where he gets his ingredients, um, which I think is really important because, you know, sometimes you don't know where those things come from. They grow a lot of them on their own family farm. But I love Dr. Orr's comments, um, a quote that Nutriberries are really a pellet that's not ground up. It's got all the ingredients of a pellet. It's just created in a ball, which is what lots of birds like to pick up and hold, which is, you know, a positive thing for their feet and their their exercise of their of their of their toes. But it also gives them a way to manipulate their food and feel like they're not just um, putting their face down in a bowl. And I don't know if you've got a nervous bird, but you know, sometimes birds are reluctant to put their face in the bowl because in the wild, that means that they're more vulnerable. So to be able to pick up food. So I recommend that for the fresh food too. You know, if you have a macaw that can pick up a chunk of mango or a, a, a stalk of broccoli, that's just as good or if not better than making it into small pieces. So um, might lead to more waste, but it's just, it's definitely um, something that's good for them mentally and physically. And then of course, be careful about dehydrated fruits. And um, a lot of times they have sulfur. That's what makes the papaya look so orange. And that sulfur is not, not a positive thing to have. Do not buy sulfur dry fruit, please. Uh, the other thing is they, they are by nature more, uh, have more calories and more sugar when, they, when they're dehydrated. Um, so you want to be careful not to overfeed something that's going to have that many calories. It depends on your bird, of course. It can be convenient, but also um, just be careful the, where you get it and to do it in moderation. All right, here's something we don't talk about very often, but I, I and you may never need to know this. I'm just throwing it out there, but um, when you go to the veterinarian, you should always, in my opinion, get a gram stain, which tells you how many positive and negative bacteria are in your bird's poop. And I have a sample down here at the bottom because a lot of people don't understand that if it says bacteria heavy, that's really good. You want good bacteria in the gut. You don't want bad bacteria in the gut. So you look at the positive, and in this case, that equals 98 out of 100. So that's great. I mean, the goal is 100, but two negative is not bad at all. It doesn't call for any kind of remediation. But sometimes there's yeast, definitely not good. Got to get ahead of that. That's fungal, very hard to cure, really a pro can be really a problem. But sometimes there's just a lot of negative bacteria, at which point your veterinarian may recommend probiotics. Or maybe, you know, your bird just needs a little probiotics because of other health issues. So, you know, Benabac's been around for a while. Aviculture is pretty good. New into the veterinary world, it was first Visbiome. And I know a lot of veterinarians started carrying that. And then Civomix is just entering the veterinary community. Um, it was promoted at the vet conference year before last. Last year was um, COVID, but it comes out of uh, Europe where they have um, figured out more precisely what kind of bacteria work best for birds, which is still one of those questions we don't have a perfect answer to. But if I had a bird, that had bacterial issues in the gram stain, I would definitely want to try to get the best probiotic I could. So your veterinarian, should you decide you wanted to branch out into one of these lesser known probiotics, uh, I put the links here. Um, you can certainly ask them if they're willing to, to get them for you. Otherwise, you know, I've been known to even use infants, children's infants, probiotics if needed because a lot of times birds have come to us from situations where it's less than optimal so a little bit of um, you know support for the digestive tract is can't hurt can't hurt in fact um, it's thought that we all need to take probiotics on a more regular basis so anyway good to know especially if you have a sick bird 
And then, you know, if you're, if you're like, I don't know where to start. I really don't know how to make variety here. Here is just a chart for you to play with and use as you see fit. You know, if you want to just say this week, we're going to do, you know, collard greens and oranges and hazelnuts. And next week we're going to do yams and apricots and pumpkin seed. I mean, the goal, the thing I want you to take away from today is that you don't want to get into a rut when it comes to your bird's diet. You want to keep adding a variety of things because each individual food item has a different value. And if I had to pick just one real food item, I would go for like the jalapeno or hot, hot peppers because those are going to really offer you good vitamin A and um, just it has a lot of, of ingredients that would be super helpful for most birds. All right, so how much? That's always the question, right? Um, and almost inevitably, we tend to have waste, um, but we need to figure out what works for each species in some cases. So I took some pictures of like at the adoption center bowls in the morning, or the big round one at the bottom is what I is more or less what my two macaws get for breakfast. So they may take several hours to plow through it, but they've got a wide variety and it changes every day. Um, they will almost always love corn and grapes, but you gotta be really light on those because that's just sugar and starch. And of course, like us, they're gonna go for the thing they like first and fill up on it. So if you gave a, an Amazon a grape, you know, they're gonna be, that's gonna fill them up. That's like you eating a whole watermelon, right? So. Uh, be really careful about feeding too many things that are not nutritious early. Make sure that they eat the things you want them to eat. You know, it's what, it's not just what you provide, it's what they eat. Liz Wilson said that many years ago, and that's always stuck with me that that is, you know, the key to making sure that they are actually benefiting from all your work of cooking, cleaning, purchasing um, a variety of foods. It's no small feat, I know, because I spend many hours chopping, cooking, and cleaning. All right. Sometimes, so we're moving now into how, from the what to the how. Uh, sometimes um, it's all about how you present it. So maybe your bird is not going to eat that cherry, which would be a really good thing for them to eat right now during cherry season. Cherries are great for countering kidney issues, by the way. And a lot of birds have high uric acid. So I encourage you to get out there and add cherries to your diet, your bird's diet uh, this month while they're around. So maybe they're not gonna pick up the whole cherry. And I personally don't worry about the seed in the middle in case you're wondering, but um, some people do. Um, maybe you need to cut it up into little pieces or maybe they really wanna hold it like Birdie is up here in the corner, right? So um, I love this picture at the bottom right from the World Parrot Trust. They, they put the fruit on a stick, which is so um, natural oriented, which is great. Other times, you know, maybe they want to um, have to search for something. It's always, it's, we call that contra free loading. It's not free. They have to work for it and they really like that. Um, or if you don't have a skewer, I encourage you to get a skewer. You can stick like a whole mini pumpkin or squash, all kinds of things. So this is a birdie in the adoption center eating her cherries. She's just so happy to hold the whole thing. Hmm. And here's uh, Jasmine. He just loves those hot peppers. So we just stick it through the bars and he goes to town. Jasmine is a good example of a bird that had very poor, um, was very vitamin A deficient, was almost white. And since Jasmine has been eating uh, the food at the landing, you can see how nice and peachy he is. That's, you know, he's turning his vitamin A is now showing in his feathers. Um, here is uh, one of our recently adopted birds in the bottom right hand corner. She, he's, he's very, um, you know, maybe I hate to use a label, but kind of one of those 
I don't know what to do with myself, birds, and kind of can get into mischief. So she's done a great job of hiding his food and paper. So he has to open different, different pieces of paper to get to different foods, which is great. And then here's uh, also um, African Gray, who's eating a pumpkin on a skewer. And you could probably leave that pumpkin for two or three days before there's a problem. Um, the, the video playing now is uh, from Brazil, where we watched the Amazons foraging for their food. Uh, they worked really hard to get to individual pods. And um, sometimes they would just hang by one foot and eat the pod upside down. But they really love those pods. But you see, they had to work hard for their food in the wild. And we make it too easy in captivity sometimes. So think about how you can enrich your bird's life by uh, using food as a means for activity and exercise. Because we all have to eat, right? Here's some other fun tips. You can just clip things to the bar. See these little cockatiels having a great time. Uh, they will actually consume a lot of that kale or collard. Um, and, or you could just put it in the water or uh, wheatgrass. Here is an eclectus who's having a great time with um, other greens. Uh, Jason Crean is great. Uh, has great ideas for making tea. So I encourage you to go uh, check out Jason Crean. I think I have some uh, links for you in a little while. Here's some more Amazons we saw in Brazil. Uh, they had a great time just picking out grasses and flowers. And, you know, part of it was just for fun, but part of it was actually consumed. And, uh, you know, if you wanted to branch out in your environment and create something like that, the pictures on the right show you an Amazon who's got a container garden next to its cage, which has got like kale, collards, nasturtium, a whole bunch of herbs. And then in the bottom, those two little parrotlets also share that container garden and love it. So that's a great way for them to have a more natural environment. You can set it up right next to the cage or put a bowl of something growing inside the cage, uh, put it on a shelf on the outside of the cage, you know, think outside the box. And then uh, this was just this week, the crepe myrtle was growing a little too big, so clipped it off. You can put it inside the cage or outside in the aviary. For all the birds in the wild, spend a lot of time eating bark or dig it in the dirt, et cetera. So a little bit of browse is, a, is just a fun, enriching thing to do. They're not necessarily gonna swallow or eat it, but it certainly is a great way for them to um, have some positive occupational activities. All right, so some of you may be familiar with the Dirty Dozen. It comes out every year. I love the environmental working group's um, efforts to help us understand what's grown with more toxins. So like the Dirty 12 are the ones that I try to always avoid buying in the store unless they're organic. And I've kind of X'd out, of course, the things that you don't want to feed like avocados or onions. And I also try to minimize the nightshade things like eggplants or tomatoes. They're not bad. They're not going to kill anybody like avocados might or onions might, but um, I just wouldn't make them a heavy part of the diet. Okay, this is to help you know, do you have a fat bird or a skinny bird? Um, with permission from this group in the UK for us to share it, I think it's a great way to understand where your bird stands on the scale. Uh, a lot of times they have cleavage, which means they're overweight, or sometimes they have a really pointed keel, which you may not be able to see unless you feel it, but a pointed keel means they're very thin and losing weight, and that's not good either. So the, the, the goal is to have just a nice, smooth, round one. Um, a lot of times birds have minimal muscles because they're not flying or getting the activity that they were built for. So, you know, that can be a problem too. But Amazons especially tend to get fat, fatter faster than they should because they tend to not be as active. 
they actually don't even fly very well in the wild. They're very heavy bodied. They work really hard to move. And that translates to our homes as well. They just don't seem to, you know, get around like they should. So all the more reason to be careful about what you feed Amazons. All right. So if you have a sick bird, I know it's our propensity to want to, you know, to nurture and hold them and comfort them. But that is what you don't want to do. A bird that is sick often can go over the edge and die if you touch them. So what you want to do is be very quiet, put them in a nice uh, dark space with food and water on the bottom where they don't have to climb or do anything. They can just save all their energy to getting well. And this is not something you can buy over the counter, but I know that this product also made by Lefevre has uh, saved many a bird's life. So if you have a really sick bird, you're, hopefully your veterinarian knows about omnivore, but if not, you know, I want you to be empowered to ask that question or seek it out because it, it literally can save your bird's life. It helps give uh, real action packed nutrition fast with all the things they need that could, um, you know, keep them from going over the brink. Okay, so now we're moving into why, why we have to have good nutrition besides just generally living, but living well, that's the goal. So up in the top left, you see what we call the papilia. It's the back of the throat. It's the first thing your vet is probably gonna look at when, you, when they go to the vet. And if they have those blunted ones on the, on the left side, they're vitamin A deficient. They're supposed to have really sharp pointed pink healthy papilla. And so if your bird has a vitamin A deficiency, that is the primary way of diagnosing that and immediately, you know, work harder on those vitamin A foods. Um, the top right is a bird with gout and, you know, gout is very debilitating and can really hurt and, and comes from having kidney disease. Um, Liver disease often manifests itself uh, like this Quaker with this overgrown beak, uh, which uh, is gonna take a while to get it back into shape because um, it's been a problem for so long. But a, at least a liver could regenerate itself. Kidneys are definitely harder to solve. I'm working with a couple of veterinarians right now on some herbal remedies that are used successfully with other animals. And we're seeing if it works for birds. And so far it looks like there's some optimistic uh, hope for some of those herbs um, because kidneys do not regenerate. So it's very important that we stay ahead of that. So if you are not getting your birds to the vet with labs on a regular basis, I cannot encourage that enough because you're not going to know if they have liver or kidney disease unless you get the, those labs done on a regular basis. So, and then of course, heart disease, which is super harder to diagnose and is the number one killer of birds these days because they're not getting the exercise and the activity and the diet that they should be getting. So, you know, they're, they're living in captivity, which is already a less active environment. And then a lot of times they're getting bad food. So just like us, without a decent diet and exercise, they're going to have heart problems. And a lot of times we don't know that until we do x-rays or if need be, even a CT scan. But um, that is really the number one killer of birds right now. So if your bird doesn't have places to go and things to do to stay as active as possible in your captive environment, I encourage you to think about how you can add more activity to your bird's life, even if it's you teaching them to flap or to, you know, you can never have enough perches in the cage, for example. That's just a really simple way to start. You need to have a, what I call a super highway of perches in the cage. They need to be moving around all the time. They need to go from one side of the cage to get a pellet and the other side of the cage to get water. Don't make it easy, make it active and fun. And, um, and then of course, don't forget to decorate the outside of the cage, hanging from the ceiling, play gyms, flight if you can allow it, et cetera. But those are the only cures to heart disease. And a lot of times 
they have heart disease and that leads to mutilation and they start picking at their skin because something bothers them inside. And so if your bird mutilates, which is, uh, can happen and it's very, very frustrating and sad and painful for the birds. It's almost always uh, an organ problem. Feather picking is a different issue. We can talk about that, you know, in many different ways, but mutilation is usually a medical problem. And oftentimes we can't diagnose it without x-rays or CT scan or something. But the good news is if your bird is diagnosed with heart disease, there are some pretty good heart meds out there. They're not cheap and they may have to be on them for life, but you know, there it is, um, can be uh, controlled to some extent. Uh, and all the more reason why to get the omega-3s in there. Omega-3s are really important for the heart. Okay, here are just some resources of things we've talked about today in terms of tea and where you can purchase products or things you can read. Uh, of course, I'll make this available to you. I'm sure there are many others. Perhaps some of you even have some great ideas. I look forward to hearing those. Um, but just be an avid learner and do your research. Don't forget to be a critical thinker. Just because somebody tells you something's good or bad, including me, that doesn't mean that's so or that it's right for your bird. So just keep researching, looking, trying different things until you find what helps your bird to nourish to flourish. Okay, here's um, just a couple of examples of how, uh, why food can take a bad situation and turn it into a better one. Um, this is a little Quaker um, recently adopted. I think she's online with us today, as a matter of fact. This was um, when she first came to us in March. Look at that, 380 on her bile acid test way. I don't think I've ever seen anything that high. And then a month later, a month later with a better diet, it's already dropping and it's continuing to drop. And so the goal is to get it back into the normal range. And again, bile acid is liver and at least livers, you know, can regenerate and there are things we can do for them. So, but you wouldn't know that unless this lab test was done. You would have continued to just think everything was okay until you found your bird on the bottom of the cage dead one day. And at that point, I encourage you to get a necropsy. You can't say they died for no reason. There's always a reason. And if you have other birds, it's really important that you find out what that reason was, okay? And just as an aside, if your bird does die and you have to have a necropsy, do not put it in the freezer. Wrap it in a wet towel and put it in the refrigerator and get it to the lab as soon as possible. And then here's Riley, which between uh, a much improved diet and Michelle's great enrichment activities, this bird changed pretty fast. It still kind of goes back and forth a little bit, but he is dramatically improved uh, thanks to good food and enrichment and also you know, a less stressful environment. All those things combined to make him uh, to get him on the path to a better life. So um, basically that's the, 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 the what, how, and why of food. And if I can do anything to answer any questions today, uh, please let me know. It's been a pleasure. And I hope you've got to walk away with at least one new idea. That's what we say, right, Michelle? Yeah. And that's a good thing to think about right now. Um, while, while you're, everything is still fresh, what do you want to do this week for your bird? And if you could think about that and put it in the chat, we always like seeing that. What one thing do you want to start? Do you want to change or incorporate um, this week? And and we do have some questions. Um, you know, Great. so one is, do you? What types of Fresh flowers can can people provide for for their birds? Yeah, definitely go to that MD Vaden site uh, for some good ideas. But the first ones that come to my mind are nasturtiums. They're really easy to grow and definitely uh, good. I think uh, marigolds are also pretty easy. 
I would not buy them from a flower shop or anything like that because they've been treated probably in some capacity. Um, some grocery stores sell fresh flowers, but hey, just get some seeds, get some organic dirt, stir the seeds in the dirt and up pop the flowers and then your bird can just go to town in its own container garden. Good enrichment too, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so someone else wanted to know like if preservatives and pellets should are a concern. There used to be ethoquoxin or something that was used a long time ago, which was a concern. I have not heard of anything recently. Have you heard anything along those lines? I, I haven't. No, I don't think there are many preservatives used anymore. And of course, if it's organic, there are no preservatives, but just be careful. I, I find the organic pellets break down really fast. It's just safer to keep them in the refrigerator or the freezer and take them out a little bit at a time. It's just not worth, you know, keep them out of the sun. Great. Um, and someone did have a special request. If you can find it in your slides without too much trouble, if you could put the basic mash recipe up again. Um, oh, sure. And kind of while you're looking for that, you know, someone else had a question about, is there a risk of overdoing herbs? Um, someone has an herb garden and likes to make a fresh bouquet of mixed herbs and the parrots eat it and destroy it. Is there anything she should be worried about though? Hmm. I don't think so. I wouldn't First be worried all, either. <laughs> I'd be, I'd be yeah. thrilled if they were making yeah. a pass and, and yeah. you know. Because they're they're mostly just tearing it up, you know, they're mostly not consuming it. And and I think they're pretty smart about knowing when their body needs something. I don't know, if you are already providing a very diverse, big variety diet to your birds, you have probably noticed that they are going on binges. They're like bananas this week or everything or apricots next week, you know. So they, they tend to know, they sense in some capacity, closer to nature than we are probably, what it is their body needs. And you may think, oh, they love apricots. I'm gonna go buy a whole bunch of apricots and then they don't need another one, right? So, I mean, go figure. Yeah, I don't think there's any problem with diving into fresh herbs, especially if they've been grown in organic dirt without pesticides. That's important. Great. Um you have any information or are fennel or caraway seeds good for birds? I've heard a lot of people feeding, uh, throwing that in. Yeah, I personally am not a fennel fan, but hey, if it floats their boat, go for it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's a problem. Do you think there's a problem? I haven't heard anything. I, I don't. I haven't heard of, of a problem of either, but I wanted to check with you since you research all kinds of things, food, and... <laughs> I, as Michelle knows, I'm a geek. Whenever we go on our uh, echo tours, I'm a pest to the guy. Do they eat that? Do they eat that? Do they eat that? Can I take that one home? You know, what do you call that in Latin? <laughs> Let me take that picture. I think I have more information about the, what the wild Moluccans and cockatoos eat in Indonesia than anybody because while Stuart Metz was alive, he, he sent me samples of them and all the languages thereof. So hopefully someday that will not all get lost, but um, yeah. And of course, don't forget that what they eat in the wild is not what they can eat in captivity, but some people went, have gone to great lengths to like burriti oil has now become part of the veterinary community because somebody went to the trouble to research what their yellow, I forget what that macaw is called, that unique uh, red belly macaw with the bright yellow skin eats in the wild and it was burriti oil and when she uh, burriti palm nuts and when she got that and added the burriti oil to the diet that bird stopped plucking but you know we don't we can't all find those fixes but that was you know it was good yes okay i love this next question just because i i have an ulterior motive um you know so the question is are peds in the pod you know pre-washed uncooked okay to feed. Absolutely. Yeah. Go for yeah. it. And I, I just think about um, 
Anne also does a lot of gardening at the Adoption Center and has even grown, I just have these great memories of um, Ollie, the blue and gold McCall picking the peas off of the vine and eating them. You know, it's, it's so they can be fed yes. fresh off the vine too. Yeah, sometimes they eat the flower before it has a chance to even grow. But right now on the Quaker aviary, these uh, the green bean vines are now winding their way inside the aviary. And at some point, whether or not they ever eat the green beans, I'll never know, but they're gonna have a lot of fun. Cucumbers is another one, uh, snap peas, anything that makes a vine up the side. You could even put a container garden next to your indoor cage, as long as the plant was still getting sun. Now it may not grow very high if they, you know, eat it early, but still it's great. It's great enrichment. Yeah. I've even taken, um, you know, you can go to like Whole Foods or something and get potted herbs and in these small little pots. And I've put them on play stands where they think, you know, where they have bowl holders, you know. Exactly. So exactly. Just, you can reuse things, repurpose. Um, someone had a question about how long does mash stay good in the freezer? Ah, good question. Uh, probably a long time. We don't um, have it that long. Uh, we probably have a month's worth, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a problem with it being four to six months. I think it would get a little freezer burn after a while. Yeah. But if you only have one bird and you're making little small containers, you only need, you know, you don't need to make a whole lot for you to have a pretty good stash, right? So, but you can make several months worth. I wanted to point out too, this bot, uh, Carmen, I don't know how she says her last name. She's a lovely woman. She's in England. I've uh, tried really hard to get her to come be our guest, but she's very shy. Her, She's got three books and um, one of them is very, maybe this one I have pictured here has a lot of flower information for the person who asked about flowers. Really, really, she just makes these beautiful decorative things that most of us are never, ever going to do. Uh, and the birds don't care. <laughs> you could just throw it all in a bowl and they're happy. But she does a lot of flowers. Right. Yes. That looks like a good resource for that on that. Excellent. Yeah. I think we still have this bird in our store, but her other two books, we don't. And they're, but they're on Amazon. She's got three books. Great. Um, so someone else had a question about houseplants. This is a really, really good um, question. Just if there's houseplants that could be toxic to birds. Yeah, boy, the two that come to mind right away are Diffenbachia and Poinsettia. Uh, and I, I think there are a whole bunch of other ones. Again, that MD Vaden site is perfect. He goes to great lengths to describe what's toxic. And in some cases, he even... Uh, out, he outlines when there's controversy about somebody saying it's good and somebody saying it's bad and what he's found to be anecdotal versus scientific. So, yeah. If you're interested in plants, I definitely put that one on your um, bookmark that page. Okay, and someone else has an eclectus that they adopted um, who is a feather picker. Um, definitely, um, they have made sure that the diet is varied. What other possible causes could there be for um, feather destructive behavior? Um, yeah. This is a good, a good opportunity to mention our upcoming class. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely July 25th. You'll want to sign up for the, um, the virtual retreat we have that is all about eclectus parrots because it's going to be with someone who's a veterinarian in Australia who also studies them in the wild. Um, but I definitely would work with your veterinarian to um, on this as well. It's feather destructive behavior is, you know, he even listed as a very common issue in captivity. And um, it could be multiple um, issues going on is um, there that that hopefully, you know, he may have some tips to help, but I would absolutely work with a, have a vet work up um, too. Yeah, the whole eclectus community is kind of uh, different from every other species. And there's a whole bunch of uh, different ideas about why they toe tap or have seizures, pellets or no pellets. Um, they seem to be extra sensitive. Um, 
to stress, mm -hmm. uh, but they're definitely, without a doubt, they need uh, an abundance of raw, real food. That for sure I would say is mission essential. Okay. Um, someone else says their CAG, their Congo, Congo African Gray, sorry, loves chicken wings and eats the bones and marrow. Um, she gives her one wing portion uh, a day from organic free range chickens and wants to know if that is too much. Another one of those highly controversial topics. If you ask uh, Dr. Scott Eccles, who we have great respect for, he says, no animal protein ever. If you ask Dr. Susan Ora, she's like, yeah, eggs are really important, especially if you have a sick bird for vitamin A and blah, blah, blah. I used to give my birds chicken legs and stuff. I don't really much anymore, but I know the grays love them, especially the marrow. Um, every day might be a little much for animal protein. I would definitely make sure that that bird has labs and you're, you're, you know, you're keeping great tabs on what that means because too much protein can be hard on the kidney at some point. So there has to be a balance. But, you know, it's also controversial about what they eat in the wild. I used to follow Don Brightsmith around in Peru and he'd say, oh, no, they don't eat any animal protein or insects. And then we go to Brazil and they're like, oh, we're studying how many insects they're eating. So, you know, I think in some cases we don't really know the extent of what they're eating. I read something the other day about the Indonesian birds eating eggs of other birds. Never read that before. Yeah, so we don't really know. But, and I don't think we can get as much information yet out of labs as we'd really like to have. That's an evolving thing for birds but at least we know we can get something. I mean, and they're changing what they consider the norms all the time. You know, the norm of a kidney reading for a macaw is different from a parakeet. And, you know, that wasn't the case 10, 20 years ago. Now they're getting more specialized. They're learning more, but you at least have to have some foundation by which to know what's going on in the inside body of your bird's body, because they're not gonna show you on the outside until they drop dead. And anybody who says they don't need to go to the vet uh, to get those readings, it is just, you know, they're wrong. Exactly, they're so different from mammals. We will whine and cry when we don't feel well. <laughs> <laughs> and they will yeah. not, they will fight it, you know, they won't show show any signs of illness until absolutely they can't, they can't, they can't hold it in anymore, you know, and then they're on death. Almost dead. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Which is why when you go to the vet at that point, if you're able to get ahead of the problem, they're going to put them in the oxygen tank and not touch them until they're at least stable enough to even do any kind of readings or diagnosis or therapy. So, yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. So someone else had a question about beans. Um, and can you use canned organic beans or how long do you need to cook dried beans? I know that that may vary by the beans type, but to avoid those toxins in them. Exactly. So if it's not adzuki, lentil, garbanzo, mung, you must cook, the, cook them, really cook them, cook them a lot, you know, fully cook them. They are toxic, supposedly. I've never heard of a bird dying of an uncooked pinto bean, but supposedly that's the truth. So I'm going with that. So the other four you can sprout and they have to make sure and have a tail. But other than that, they must be cooked. So if you open a can of black beans, for example, that were cooked, that would be fine. They may not hold up more than two or three days. So they, you know, they, they go bad pretty fast. So don't feed them bad beans later. Yeah. Good tip, yeah. Um, so someone else, because you talked a lot about hot peppers, are there particular hot peppers that you know are really good for them or can they feed any hot peppers, anything to avoid? Um, and can they be fed fresh or dried or both? Good question. Um, well, hot peppers have capsicum or whatever that is, I don't say it right, which is supercharged 
for, uh, for making vitamin A available in the body. And because their taste buds are not the same as ours, they can eat those really, really hot ones without any problem. Sometimes they just love them. I have trouble even just cutting them up. I have a like an adverse almost reaction to them. But a bird, no, you could just hand them the hottest of the hottest and, and go for it. I'm growing cayenne and something else right now in the garden. And the plan is to just lop them off and throw them in the bowl. So dried, um, maybe only in the dehydrator, I guess would be okay. Yeah. yeah I mean, they put dried hot peppers in those packaged bird foods, right? Or yeah. Nutri-berries. Yeah. And peppers, I do like dehydrating. They, they, um, you know, sucks because they're so full of water um, that, you know, right. if you're going to keep it, it's, they don't necessarily freeze well usually, but you can dehydrate them and get a little bit, you know, longer out of some of them. Right. And just, you know, give them a whole one, let them hold it. And uh, they can, you don't have to like take it out after three hours. It's probably going to be okay in the cage for even a couple of days, you know, it's okay. Yeah, they often like eating the little pepper seeds. I've even heard of someone whose bird loves the pepper seeds so much that she uses pepper seeds as training treats. Wow, that's <laughs> fantastic. I know since I started uh, uh, cooking for my birds that I don't peel my carrots anymore. I don't de-seed my peppers anymore. I love the little seeds in the pepper. I mean, you find that some of the most nutritious parts of the parts we were taught, you know, were the stalk of the broccoli, all that's more nutritious than the, than the buds of the broccoli, all that stuff is great for them and us. Well, I think a long time ago, Anne, you said something in a class that I always remember, which is don't do any work for your bird that your bird can <laughs> do his or herself. And it just makes so much sense. We, we spend so much trying, time trying to come up with jobs for them to keep them busy, right? So why are we- right doing all this stuff with food or things that they could do themselves. <laughs> I think you even told me a couple of weeks ago that the watermelon, you saw them eating the rind and yes. instead of, the, yeah. So why take the rind off when maybe that's what they needed today? Yeah. Yeah. Andy the cockatoo was eating that rind and mm -hmm. to be enjoying it. So, yep. So here's a, here's a good question, and this we've done whole talks on just this, but I'm wondering if we could at least help someone get started, because it is related to food too, how to get started in teaching their bird to forage. And I'm so glad that you realized too that some birds need to be taught to forage because they're it's stepping stone. So you know, I think you should answer that one, Michelle, because you're the foraging enrichment queen, as far as I'm concerned. So go for Thank it. Thank you. Willing. Yeah. Well, one tip, you know, that I think everyone should see, and maybe um, Cassie could put a link in the chat to it, is the captive foraging video, which is really old. It's like a, over a decade old, but it is now freely available. Um, I think Harrison's Bird Food has it on their website. You can also see it on YouTube, but it's a great way to talk about how to start and step a bird up into foraging. But sometimes, you know, and also as part of the question, it was it seemed like, you know, that the bird maybe not doesn't realize that there's food and things. Sometimes we have to model. If they don't have a flock, sometimes I think we can show them that a toy might have food in it or something and make it really easy at first. Um, so Anne showed Riley earlier, um, who we, the, the eclectus who had really terrible feathers. And the two things that we were told is, you know, he didn't eat, um, well, he, he didn't have a very varied diet and he didn't play with toys. Um, whenever I am told a bird doesn't play with toys, I, I say mission accepted, you know, <laughs> challenge accepted, you know. Um, and one of the things I did was I just started putting food on all of his toys where he could see it really easy, just walk up to it and take it. Um, but then you start realizing that they start getting into the habit of, oh, food could be anywhere, you know, and looking around for it. You could also add more bowls. So they have to check every bowl and start out with a favorite good food thing right away. But then um, 
you know, then maybe their favorite thing isn't in every bowl in the cage and you vary it. Maybe there's nothing, maybe there's a toy instead. Um, but you can start out and just kind of step them into it. Okay. Oh, someone had a good question too um, on grit. Um, because yeah, that is something that has changed um, in recommendations. Do you want to mention something on that, um, Anne? Sure. Yeah. Uh, don't fall for it. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. it's, I don't know why the pet store is still selling it. Somebody told me the other day that some of those bad things in the big box stores, like the uh, mite protector, which is stupid, and the grit are both being kind of winged out. I think uh, the passerines may need a little bit, the can canaries or finches, but hookbills, parakeets to macaw, absolutely not. It can uh, cause impaction in their crops and all kinds of other problems, so no. Great. Yeah, so um, that sounds good. Any other um, tips you wanna share? Final words about food? Oh, I didn't look in the, um, the chat to read off some of the, uh, the, the things people are gonna do. Um, oh, great. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. I'd uh, like to know what hit home most, that'd yeah. be great. Yeah, so if anyone, um, if you're still on and want to send, what are you going to do um, this coming week for your birds? Someone's going to cook their beans. Um, someone is, uh, someone else had a question I see in the chat. Is it okay to feed quinoa uncooked or just soaked? They don't usually like it uncooked. They, you could soak it or sprout it. Uh, and that'd be just as good, if not better than cooked, actually, because it's live plant growing plant at that point. Yeah, it hasn't stopped growing. It's still growing. That's why you could leave sprouts in the cage longer than you might other whole foods because they're alive. They're growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. And someone else said that they're going to be offering cherries and hot peppers. There are two things that they normally don't give their, their birds. Yep. Someone else said they're getting hot peppers. Um, yeah, go get those cherries right now, everybody. This is a really important thing to do. Ah, and someone said they're pulsing their veggies this week because they're con your beelines for the fruit. So they're going to sneak those, sneak <laughs> the veggies in there. Um, someone else said that they're going to add quinoa. Someone else said they're going to add more movement um, in their cage, which is great. Uh, grow Yay. sprouts. Yay. And do Yay. a garden near the Amazon's cage. Great. Feel free to email if you have questions about sprouting. Do not be intimidated. It's easy to be intimidated, but it's not hard. So go for it. Yes. Someone else is going to um, provide a whole, whole pumpkin um, for, yes. for Halloween, which is great. Um, Someone else is going to try Kamut. A lot of birds love Kamut. So I hope that they have the same reaction that, that a lot of birds do. Um, it's high on our wish list, on our Amazon wish list, because we go through so much of it. Yes. OK, excellent. So any, any other final words of wisdom? Well, I hope that when you work hard to feed your bird better. You're gonna work hard to feed yourself better too because we need you and your bird to live long, happy, healthy lives together. And while we're here to help birds find new homes, we're happier when they stay in good homes. And you, if you are here today trying to learn, that is the best sign ever because if we don't continue to try to learn and make our, our birds' lives better, then, um, you know, there's always something new to learn. There's always something new to do in any relationship, but especially for the animals we love and care for. So thank you for being here today and share your stories with us. We love stories, good, bad, ugly. If we can help in any way, uh, please feel free to reach out. And thanks for being here again. We're really grateful that you were. Yes, we always, always, always are appreciative of the fact that you have chosen to spend some time on your Sunday to learn something to do more for your birds. And we never want to stop learning, right? 
Right, exactly. So, That's the key. So within a couple of days, I'll send out a link to the recording of the presentation. And Anne, are the slides okay to share? Can we send those as well? At Absolutely. That so you'll um, have I have to figure out how to send them to you in a in a way that's not, you know, 196 zillion megs. So we'll work on that. Yeah. So it might be a few days. Yes. Uh, I can attest to the fact that the, the internet is not very strong um, in Western North Carolina where Anne is located. So give us a couple days, but you'll get the information again and you can watch it again and it'll be interesting if you watch it again if you pick up something new because I know every time I watch something again I see something else that I completely missed the the first time so thank you again for joining us and I hope you'll join us for other events if you have an eclectus just definitely join us for the July 25th event or even if you just love eclectus you know <laughs> and there'll be other Thanks great for helping today Michelle great. thank, thank you, you. And until next time, everyone. Bye. Bye.